We have four esteemed speakers who will be presenting their thoughts and ideas on this, on this theme. And to start off this session, we have Dr. Christoph Benzmuller from the University of Luxembourg. Dr. Christoph, Christoph Benzmuller obtained his PhD in 1999 and his habilitation in 2007 in computer science from Saarland University, Germany. His research focuses on the automation of expressive logics in computer science, artificial intelligence, math, and philosophy. In 2012, he was awarded with the Heisenberg Research Fellowship of the German National Research Foundation, or DFG. In, his position, in this position, he is currently affiliated with FU Berlin, Germany, and with Stanford University in the United States. So ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Dr. Christoph Benz Muller, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. I have to correct one thing. It's uh, currently University of Luxembourg, the second affiliation. I was visiting Stanford for some time. So um, a big thank you to the organizers, Varun, Vasudeva, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. I really enjoy AISQ conference. I have been already to another one three years ago, AISQ 2015 in Karakpur. And also that was a very, very, very pleasant experience. And actually the presentation I give today, you see the title, Can Computers Help to Sharpen Our Understanding of Ontological Arguments, is a kind of continuation of the work I presented uh, at 2015. A lot of things have happened till then, uh, since then, and uh, this is what I'm going to address in today's presentation. So that brings me to this overview of uh, today's presentation. Namely, I will start with a small recap of the work I've presented at 2015. I also need to introduce the methodology and the main findings presented there, because those findings give a motivation for what I do in part C of this presentation. Namely, I compare variants of the ontological argument um, that were presented after the work of Gödel and Scott by uh, Anderson and Fitting with the variant of uh, Gödel and Scott. So I do these experiments on the computer. So what we do here is kind of um, exercise in computational metaphysics. And um, this comparison actually uses notions I have to introduce in part B of the talk, namely uh, from philosophy of language, the extension and intention of properties, a notion I briefly need to explain, and uh, the notion of ultra filters from mathematics. These will be our tools for the comparison. And then we can discuss the relevance of these insights we gain from the study. So part A, uh, this is the recap, and there's of course related work on in computational metaphysics, for instance by Ed Salter and colleagues, but also John Rushby. Uh, they also did experiments using computer technology, but uh, most of the re uh, related work concentrated on earlier experiments in, uh, on the ontological arguments, and you all know that uh, this has a long tradition, the argument is going back to the work of Anselm, and many philosophers have then picked up the work and criticized it or further developed it. There's a huge body of literature on the ontological argument out there. Today we will just look in three variants that have been proposed. So as I said, I will focus on Gödel's work and then continue and study later works by Anderson and by Fitting. And I give you the motivation in a second. This is the scriptum uh, of Kurt Gödel that was found in his Nachlass after his death. Uh, you see it's dated uh, 1970, but he worked silently on it, um, and a few persons did know about it. One person was Dana Scott, I, I, come, I come to that in a second. So it's a deductive argument for the necessary existence of God. So you start with some basic notions, like uh, the central notion here, of uh, being godlike, a godlike entity, and this is defined uh, in Gödel's work as follows. So, being godlike is equivalent to having all uh, positive properties. You see here, this is a higher order notion, or at least second order notion, because we have a quantification over properties instead of just quantifying over individuals. 
So that's one challenge. So we need an, uh, uh, something beyond first order logic to, to capture that. Um, then in the end, the deductive argument concludes by uh, making use of the definitions and axioms with the statement, necessarily there exists God. So there's another challenge involved here, namely this modality, necessarily there exists God. No, not just in this world by accident, necessarily it exists. So um, we also need an appropriate formalization of notions of necessity and possibility, and modal logic gives us that. There is a variant by Dana Scott. Uh, Dana talked to Gödel in 72 about this work, and he took notes and he presented an own work, uh, his own variant of the argument. And here's the main difference. That's in the notion of essential properties described here. So Gödel says property E is an essential property of an individual X if and only if all of X, X's properties are entailed, implied by E. Dana Scott adds here the uh, conjunct that X has actually to be uh, an, um, X has actually property E, which is not required in the definition by, by Gödel. So a slight a subtle difference, but it has a huge impact. You will see that in a second. Um, higher order modal logic, I motivated it. We, we need that in order to capture the, uh, the, this modality, this challenge of uh, the, the modal modality uh, talking about necessary there exists uh, a godlike entity. And uh, well, you could use this box operator. That's typically you, you, you do in modal logic. You use an additional um, logical connective box, and then uh, we read it as P is necessary. In other contexts, you could also use it to talk about obligation or about knowledge and belief and so on. And the dual of that is then uh, possibly uh, P is possible, that we use the diamond operator. So both of these operators don't have a truth functional semantics, so you can't, for instance, define them uh, simple as you, simply as you do for other connectics, uh, connectives, the classical ones by truth tables, and you typically then extend your logic by these, these new operators, so these new modal operators. And you need to give them a semantics, and I have to characterize that a little bit. And uh, this is Kripke style semantics, it's a typical thing you do, po called also possible world semantics, and I need to explain that briefly because that's relevant for, for later on. Um, so instead of evaluating formulas statically in a world as it is, modal operators talk, talk about necessary truth. So, uh, and that's captured here by the idea that we talk about different alternatives of the world as it could be. Saying in a current world situation, necessarily P holds, or think about a statement like necessarily the weather today is good, means actually that in all alternative worlds as we could think of, the, the uh, property P holds, so the, the weather would be good. Here in this case, we have P in all alternative worlds, and you can see these altern alternative worlds are captured uh, by these accessibility relations. We can, we can access them, and in all of those accessible worlds, property P holds. So then we can say in this world, necessarily P. Okay? And um, uh, the same for the dual. The dual says possibly Q. Uh, that means there's at least one possible world in which Q holds, and we have that here. Keep that a bit in mind, this idea of a possible world semantics, because that will be relevant later on. Now, what we do in these experiments on the computer is we now enter not the natural language parts of the arguments, but the formulas associated with them. And then we ask the computer, the tier improvers, tier improving technology, uh, implemented on computers to actually verify whether the intermediate steps in the argument, so the intermediate theorems and corollaries um, are valid and whether the final statement necessarily there exists a godlike being finally follows. Well, I can tell you, meanwhile, these theorem proofs we are using are so good that you can ask the final question directly. So we don't need the intermediate steps even anymore. Uh, they got stronger and stronger, and we don't need all these argumentation steps as presented by, by humans and papers to pick you. Um, I could give you now a demo. Unfortunately, I don't have time, but when you like, ask me. I can show you lots of demonstrations of that work later on the computer. We can sit together, and I can do that. A few words about this technology we use in the background now. Um, so I motivated that we are interested here in an application in metaphysics. 
uh, and we use higher order model logic as the base logic to, to carry these this studies out. Well, when I uh, first started the, our experiments, there was no theorem prover available for higher order model logic. So what we did is actually we encoded, that is a trick we contributed, we encoded higher order model logic um, or embedded it semantically in classical higher order logic, in a classical higher order logic. And that worked surprisingly well, and that had the effect that we could reuse existing technology for classical higher order logic. For instance, uh, the proof assistant system Isabel Hall, developed in Mun Munich and Cambridge. And this is nice because now we have access to proof automation inside that tool. There's a tool called Sledgehammer, and that provides a link and a bridge uh, to state-of-the-art theorem provers. First order theorem provers, higher order theorem provers like my own one, Leo2, uh, or SMT solvers, Z3 and CVC4. Uh, very powerful systems. Um, well, we can do more. Inside that system, we also can try not only to prove theorems, but we can also try to refute conjectures. And this we do with so-called model finders or counter model finders. They are also available inside and they provide us a counter model if a statement is not uh, valid or they try to find one. It's an undecidable problem in general. Here systems nitpick and Nunchaku also now internally use other proofers, SMT solvers, and in the end, uh, they all uh, refer to SAT solving technology. And the SAT solving technology has been improved over the last decade in impressively. So that means we have now access to this entire world of tier improving technology now via applying this nice encoding trick here of higher order modal logic and higher order logic. And you can do that for other logics. That means what I currently do is I have done also studies in category theory using free logic as the, the logic to carry out the experiments and I've encoded, embedded that in classical higher order logic with, uh, together with Dana Scott. And at the moment in Luxembourg, I was interested in the machine ethics and there I use steontic logics and these again are encoded in uh, uh, classical higher order logic and I reuse the technology. So that's a quite universal approach I, I sketch here, but here we apply it for applications in metaphysics and uh, in the moment higher order modal logic. Okay, so now briefly, uh, very short, the results of uh, last, uh, the experiments we conducted before and then I come to the new results um, afterwards. The variant of Dana-Scott is consistent. So all the assumptions, definitions and uh, um, axioms given are consistent. Uh, and the steps in the argument are logically correct. So in the end, we can verify necessarily there exists God with computer technology. That is what I claim here. And that does not work just for ontological arguments. You can apply it to many, many other arguments in philosophy or metaphysics. The variant of Kurt Gödel, unfortunately, the one presented on the scriptum, uh, dated 1970, is not consistent. So it has an inherent problem, an inherent contradiction of the axiom. So everything follows. We have explosion. That's, of course, a problem. So we have to reject it, and we have to better adopt the uh, modification suggested by Dana Scott. Now, the interesting thing is that humans had not seen that. The theorem provers found that out. So Leo found that out uh, for the first time, as far as I know, and I've asked many people whether that was known before. Uh, meanwhile. So that means this technology can even reveal flawed arguments and it can contribute new knowledge in interaction with humans, but eventually even already quite alone. <clears throat> now let's continue with Scott's version. We can ask now whether we have further corollaries or further side effects of the axioms. And yeah, you can prove uh, monotheism uh, depending on the notion of equality. Uh, then you can prove that God is flawless in the sense that it can only, that God can only have positive properties. But unfortunately, and that is now the motivation for this talk, you can only, uh, you can also prove as a side effect that this formula holds, modal collapse, and see what it says. It says, given in a current world, if phi holds in that current world, then I have already necessarily phi. So in all reachable worlds, I also have phi. That means, 
um, phi is not distinguishing the current world from all alternative worlds. And if I have that properties for all phi, that essentially collapses that picture you have seen before where I showed you possi different possible worlds. So that basically can be uh, seen as a claim that everything is determined. There are no alternatives. Everything is determined. We can even go as far and say there is no free will. So that's, of course, a problem. Now, we have a nice deductive argument for necessary existence of God, but we have to accept that as a side result. And many philosophers didn't want to accept that, and that motivated much further work uh, in the area to try to fix the situation and modify the axiom so that you preserve necessary existence of God, but uh, don't have that side effect. Okay, so that is the motivation, and here we look now in two versions that have been contributed by philosophers Anderson and Fitting, which actually avoid the modal collapse. And the question we ask here is, how do they achieve that? How do they av avoid the modal collapse? And are their solutions uh, kind of related? Seemingly not. If you look at the beginning, this, they seem not related. But we, find, but we will find out that they are. And the tools we use is um, from mathematics, ultra filters, and from philosophy of language, a distinction between extension and intention of predicates. So we need to talk now about these notions before we can present the results. Extension and intention of uh, predicates. So I, I want to explain that with an example. Think of a world and where uh, a situation where I have five individuals here, A, B, C, D, and E, and uh, we think now about a um, um, predicate is grand, uh, is a grand master in chess. Um, and it happens to be that in this current world we're in, we have two persons here in green, B and C, which are at grand master level in chess playing. So this is the extension of the idea of the predicate is chess grand master in the current world. So that would be the extension. The intention is the idea. The idea of being a grand chess, grand chess master could be um, instantiated or could have different extensions in other worlds. Like we could have D, we could think of D being also an, 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 a grand chess master. Maybe he's becoming better over time. Uh, or here we have E, or here we have uh, four of them being at grand master level. So this is the distinction between extension and intention. Extension gives you the individuals in a current world for the intention of a predicate, okay? So we can see the intention and, uh, of, an, of the predicate as a function over words, which gives you the extensions. So now I need a little bit more. I need this operation here of, uh, I call it rigidly intentionalized extension of a predicate. Think about the situation again. I'm standing in the current world. I look now at the extension of the predicate is chess master, is a grand master in chess. And now I want to fix that extension and transform it, transfer it to the other worlds. So that's a simple operation. Eh? I simply take that as a kind of constant function over the worlds now and transfer it to the, the other ones. Or in other words, you could say I'm referring back now to the extension of the predicate is, grand ch uh, is a ch chess grandmaster in world four. Uh, I'm referring back to the meaning I had in, in world one. Right? So I, I just make it rigid and transfer it to the, the other worlds. That's an operation I will later apply. Keep that in mind for, for a second. The other notion that, that, uh, that I've been using in the experiments is that of an ultra filter for mathematics. And I again want to explain that very briefly by giving you an example. So you see here, it's defined first by taking an arbitrary set X. Well, that can be infinite. Here we make things simple. We choose an, an X consisting of exactly four elements, one, two, three, and four. Then an ultra filter is defined as a subset of the power set. Uh, and the power set you all know consists here of 16 elements. I've listed them here. Um, and this subset is actually constrained by the condition here. The conditions one to four. And I want to illustrate them now by an example. So let's take an arbitrary subset of the power set, this one here, consisting only of the set which contains one and four. And let's check now how we can extend that to an ultra filter by going through the conditions. First condition, empty set is not in you. That's given here, so nothing to do. Second condition, if A is a subset of B, and A is already an element of you, then I have to add all, uh, then I have to add B to you. So I have to add all supersets uh, of 
the given set in, in U already. That actually motivates the addition of these uh, sets here. These are supersets of this set, and I have to add them. Now, uh, condition three says, if A and B are elements of U, then so is their intersection. Nothing to do in this case, because all the intersections of those sets are already in. Uh, now I have a, an, an, an subtle condition here that says, either A or its relative complement, X without A is an element of U. Think now of the following sets. Unit set one and its relative complement consisting of two, three, and four. So here I have to make a choice now which one I, want, I, I, I put in. And I select here simply one. So none of them are in yet, I put the one in. So now you can see now I have to extend again. Uh, oh well, empty set is still not in, but here I have to add now in the next case um, all, the, all the supersets in this case. So that, that actually is extension by the supersets and now you can check the remaining conditions, I'm done. So this is now fine, this condition is now fine, all are fulfilled, so I have found an ultra filter, it's a subset of the power set, and there's one distinguished interesting element here, this is the element one, because this is the element which has, uh, so to say, all the properties in the ultra filter, or it's an element of all the elements in the ultra filter. It's an interesting thing because uh, later we will associate ultra filters with the notion of positive uh, properties and positive properties were used to define God likeliness. Okay? All right. Uh, so that was now a bit of mathematics. Uh, try just to get the rough idea. Uh, here again, see the illustration of the construction I just did. That is an ultra filter here. Uh, that is the entire power set we have, we have been looking at. Okay. Uh, now we come to the central results of uh, this uh, contribution here. We compare now the variants of Gödel and Scott with those of Anderson and Fitty. This is now the variant of Gödel and Scott in natural language presentation. Let's go through that briefly that you get an idea of how the argument works. Definition, we have seen it already, being godlike is equivalent to having all positive properties. Then we add axioms, axiom A1 that characterizes now uh, positive properties. I, so exactly one of a property or its negation is positive. So it's a kind of exclusive or statement on the level of properties. Um, any property entailed by a positive property is positive. That's axiom A2. Axiom A3, the combination of any collection of positive properties is itself positive. Now we can take A1 and A2 and uh, formulate the first theorem and prove it. Every positive property is possibly instantiated, possibly exemplified. Then definition D1 and A3, from those we can conclude T2, being godlike is a positive property. Now we put those two here together and conclude being godlike is possibly instantiated. So we have possi the possibility uh, for, for uh, a godlike being. Now we continue in the second part. You see now, first part we were proving that uh, God's existence is possible. Now we prove that uh, God's, uh, God's existence is even necessary if it is possible. Okay, and then conclude that God-like uh, God -like being is necessarily instantiated. Here we need the definition of essence. You have seen it already before. And I take here the one that has been suggested by Scott to make the argument consistent, the axioms consistent. Then I add a further axiom, positive properties are necessarily po uh, positive, and I can conclude from A1, the, the, the one we have seen before, and A4 here, that being godlike is an essential property of any godlike individual. With a further definition, necessary existence, which is defined as follow, uh, necessary existence of an individual is the necessary instantiation of all of its essences, and the further axiom, necessary existence is a positive property, we can now prove that being godlike, if instantiated, is necessarily instantiated. Okay? And this is the, 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 the last step, that is what we wanted, because now we can combine part one with the theorem T5, and then we get being godlike is necessarily instantiated. So that's the argument in a nutshell. Um, 
And uh, what we now actually did, we verified it on the computer, it works, and I said we can prove modal collapse, and that means we have to accept determinism. But now I said we want to compare that with the other variants later on, and we do that with the notion of ultra filters. And here's an interesting observation. Positive properties have been applied here in the context of the Gödel argument, Gödel-Scott argument, to intentional properties, so the, to the ideas of the properties. And for those notion of positive properties, I can prove with the computer directly that it's an ultra filter. Now I could think of this operation. I could now try, uh, how about fixing the extension of uh, uh, positive property in the current world and relating and transferring that to all other possible worlds? So then I get an alternative notion, namely uh, the set P prime here, namely the set of rigidly intentionalized extension of positive properties in the current world. And for this notion, I can also prove that it is an ultra filter, and I can even show that both are equal with the theorem provers. So there is no distinction between intention and extension when I take the axioms by Gödel and Scott. An interesting observation, because that will be different now, and that is different now in the other versions. I could go now and show you that on the computer, demonstrate that, how we did these formalizations, and the movie is prepared, don't have time for it. Anyway, I should briefly check the time. Um, so let's go to Anderson's version. Anderson's version doesn't mo modify that much. So that is exactly as, at the moment, still as in the Gödel-Scott version, and Anderson says, well, the trouble here is axiom A1, so this exclusive or statement over positive properties. And Anderson says, let's split that first in its two directions, so we have now A1A and A1B, that are the two directions here. If a property is positive, then its negation is not positive. And if the negation of a property is not positive, then the property is positive. And he says, let's get rid of the second one. So he deletes that one. This is interesting because now is also room for neutral properties. That has often, often been a criticism uh, on the Gödel argument. They are only positive and the opposite of positive negative properties allowed. Now we have also room for neutral properties. So unfortunately, we can't prove the final result when we do that. We have to do further modifications. And Anderson modifies the definition of being godlike. He says being godlike is now equivalent to having all and only the positive properties as necessary properties. Um, and that can be also justified that this is an, a wise modification. Don't go into that any further. And he needs a second modification. It needs to make the notion of essence a bit more complicated. I don't dive into it. We don't have the time to really go into the details here. But this is the modifications he has to apply. And then he can again prove being godlike is necessary instantiated. And we verified it on the computer. It works. And um, what you get now is the model finders present you now a counter model to the modal collapse. So modal collapse is indeed, we verify it on the computer by presenting and computing a counter model, not valid anymore. And uh, that means now we have room for non-determinism. So we don't have to accept determinism anymore. Now let's look again at that from the notion of uh, ultra filter. So here, positive properties were still applied to intentional properties, but we cannot prove anymore that this notion of positive properties is an ultra filter. We get a counter model. But I did the experiment now also for the modified notion for the rigidly intentionalized extension of positive properties, and this is still an, an ultra filter. So it seems that it is sufficient that actually require that for this notion, uh, that, you know, char characterize that as an, an ultra filter, and that's sufficient actually for the, the proof to go through, but to block the modal collapse, okay? And surprisingly, we find the same pattern now in the work by Melvin Fitting, but it seems very different at the very beginning. Very, uh, the, he, he introduces from the very beginning an, an intentional logic, and an intentional higher order modal logic allows you to distinguish now properly between intention and extension. I had to work a bit hard in the framework here to, to make that happen in the previous version, but he says directly, um, I want to concentrate on the extensions only of positive properties, and that's, that's the clue. So what he does, he leaves the, the argument essentially the same as it is in the Gödel-Scott version. So nothing changes on the surface. The only thing that changes is that his notion of positive properties and also the notion of essence 
are applied only to extensions of properties and not to the intentions. Remember? And that is essentially the same as rigidly intentionalizing the extensions as I did in the operation. So what you can prove now is also that modal collapse has a counter model and uh, you can prove that that notion of positive properties, which corresponds essentially to the P prime from before, is an ultra filter. So you 